Hello and welcome to the Highway to Health show. And before we get started, let me just address the elephant in the room, uh, my voice. So obviously, well, we have a toddler at home and with him being a toddler and spending a lot of time at daycare, it seems like we're just passing a cold virus between one another to just can't seem to shake it off. Hopefully it will be gone soon. But in any case, the show must go on. And for that, my guest for this episode is Susan Verkovitz. She has been a speech-language pathologist for over 40 years, working mostly with augmentative alternative communication. And if you don't know what that means, and it also stands for AAC, we're going to talk a lot about that in this episode. So Susan runs her own practice in Southern California, where she provides independent evaluations uh, in augmentative alternative communication consultations, and where she also trains and develops other speech pathologists. And so what I really liked about talking to Susan was discovering how inclusion is so much more about being able to communicate yourself. A lot of the times what most of us think when we think about communication skills or communication assistance is for a child to be able to communicate when she's hungry or when she's thirsty or when she needs to go to the bathroom. And while these certainly are communication skills, they are merely the basic ones. Communication goes well beyond just expressing our basic needs. Being able to tell someone else how we feel or if something hurts or if something worries us These are all necessary communication skills, and every person should have access to them. And that's where people like Susan come in, helping those who can normally communicate like we all do to be able to be a part of this world, to communicate successfully. And by the way, October is Augmentative Communication Awareness Month, so give this episode a listen and help us out by sharing it and making other people aware of augmentative communication as well. Now, before we go on to today's episode, let me just quickly remind you about our free Facebook group where we've been posting some additional interviews with other amazing experts. These are interviews we also recorded for the podcast on video format, but which won't be airing for a few months, and so we're releasing them in advance on the group. The bonus there is that you also get to chat with the experts by leaving them a comment on the video and asking any follow-up questions you may have. To join, you just need to head on over to dre.show forward slash group. But let's not keep you any longer. Here is my interview with Susan Verkovitz. Remember, you're in the Highwood Health and I'm your guide to get you there. Are you ready to live ageless? Want to discover alternative health choices, cutting edge nutrition, and fitness for the entire family? Welcome to Highway to Health Show with your host, Dr. E, the stem cell guy, where Dr. E helps you live ageless. And now, here's your host, Dr. E. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Highway to Health Show. Joining me today is Susan Berkowitz. She's been a speech language pathologist for several years and has a lot of experience, especially with the young ones, with the little ones. Uh, But I'm not going to go into that. I'll let her do that. So Susan, why don't you say hi to our audience and share a little bit more about your journey and your background? Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm glad you are joining us this morning or whenever. Um, I've been a speech language pathologist for more than 40 years. So yeah, several Um, I have been working with kids with autism um, for even longer than that. Uh, It's uh, where I always wanted to be. When I was uh, young, I saw a documentary on TV about autism, and I was hooked. It just fascinated me. So um, that's where I headed. I have uh, a master's degree in psychology, in uh, education, in speech pathology, in audiology. So I feel... I've got a fairly well-rounded uh, background, um, and I can look at teaching nonverbal kids to use augmentative communication with a variety of teaching strategies and conceptual ideas behind it. And my mission for the last um, oh couple of decades has really been to educate parents. Um, in my practice, I just see over and over and over again parents not knowing what to do, Uh, not getting answers from schools uh, who possibly don't have a speech pathologist who knows about AAC either. And, um, And I want parents to feel empowered 
uh, to not feel like they're lost and nobody is helping them, or that they have to wade through masses of information on the internet uh, to get what they need. And so that's what I've been doing. I think that's very important in, in my experience as well with, uh, you know, treating children with autism and other children with, with special needs. The amount of, number one, the amount of misinformation that is out there that patients have, to, that parents have to sift through without really yes. having a guideline. Yeah, truly awful. Really, it is. It is tremendous. And then the other side of what you just mentioned, a lot of the times they're not getting the answers from the sources they would expect to get them from, like from a school. Exactly. Exactly. Speech pathology um, has a variety of required uh, courses and information that graduate students get, but augmentative communication is not one of them. And many graduate programs don't even have a class that you can elect to take. So speech pathologists come out into the world needing to find their own information if they're interested. Um, and often they're not interested until a kid lands on their caseload and then they have to figure out what to do. So um, when I uh, told people, other speech pathologists, that I was thinking of writing a book and I was going to write it for parents. Many of them said, please make it accessible to us too. We don't want to have to wade through another textbook to get the information. We want it simple. And so the information for parents works as well for busy therapists who want step-by-step, -step, easy, actionable, here's what you do and how you do it, um, which is why I wrote my book um, and why I've been doing what I've been doing. I've been in private practice here in Southern California for more than 20 years and um, training parents uh, as well as school staff and uh, people in the community is uh, sort of my number one focus. I see. But let, let's back up a little bit uh, before we get into that. A lot, of, a lot of the people listening to us, we've identified our parents and not all of them. I mean, based on my background, obviously, the first couple of people who started listening to, to the podcast were my former patients. So a lot of them are parents of children with special needs. But since then, uh, the show has, and I'm very grateful for it, has grown quite a bit. And now we have a lot of different parents who, yes. who, who listen to us. What is, uh, a, can you explain to us, what, it, what does a speech pathologist do? Speech pathologists um, are engaged and tasked with working with individuals who have communication disorders of any type. Um, people, especially uh, parents uh, and teachers in school districts, think of us as speech teachers working on a child's articulation skills or stuttering. Um, but that's not all we do. And in fact, I've not ever done either of those things uh, once I left grad school. Uh, we cover a wide range of language uh, disabilities. And language is, of course, key to our success everywhere, social, academic. Um, and so students who have language disorders, whether they're mild or very severe, uh, need help with navigating using language in social contexts, in educational contexts, and learning uh, vocabulary, syntax, uh, social skills, all of those things. And so that's what a speech pathologist does. We even uh, do some teaching in the language uh, basis of reading. Does it also involve the nonverbal communication skills? Yes, absolutely. So communication is a wide array of things, and we all use multiple modes of communication. Uh, we use a lot of nonverbal. We use facial expressions, and we use hand gestures and body language, and all of those things contribute to the communication that we do. And so even those of us who are very verbal uh, also rely on those nonverbal uh, communication course. Yeah, we see we see that, and, and going back to our fields, we see that a lot in the autistic community, where, where yeah. children might not be verbal, but they still communicate in their own way. Exactly, exactly. That's, that's very interesting. And what is the difference? Is is there a difference between a speech pathologist and a speech therapist? Back in the old days, when I came out of graduate school, uh, there was a difference. Um, this was back in the days when licensing was just becoming a thing in many states, when um, uh, states and school districts were requiring uh, speech therapists who had bachelor's degrees and had been treating students to, uh, to go back and get their master's degrees. Um, and so back then, that was the difference. A speech therapist typically had a bachelor's degree, a speech pathologist had a master's degree. 
a lot of people use the terms very interchangeably these days. Um, you sort of can't get much of a job um, without a master's degree unless you're a, a speech therapy assistant. And so uh, people just use the terms pretty interchangeably. I see. And talking about more practical things, other than when we have an obvious um, speech delay or, or, or special needs in, in a child, when else can parents start needing a, a speech pathologist? Well, any time that a child's communication skills and abilities do not meet where he should be, what he can be doing, what his potential might be. Um, and so uh, parents are their child's best teacher. They always have been. They always will be. Um, in the educational setting, we sometimes tend to forget that. And yet parents spend more time with their children than anybody. Um, if you look at language development, um, children learn so much before they get to school, before they start talking with other people. Uh, there are hours and hours of input um, in that first year, year and a half of life with parents talking to their children before the child ever opens their mouth and says a word. And we need to do that with all of our students, no matter how they're going to communicate. And, and parents are the best person. One of the best ways to build language skills in any child is through routines, because routines are predictable, they're repetitive, they provide lots and lots of opportunities because they're things that you do all the time. And so parents can start looking at those routines and the things that they say and the way that they say them, giving their child that language input long before anybody else gets their hands on them. But when you notice that you're not getting the response that you might expect, or the child is um, either not understanding or not um, using those nonverbal gestures before they start to speak. Um, anytime you see that there's a lag or a delay um, in that way, go get a referral. Um, the school districts are uh, mandated to provide services um, up after the child turns three. Before that, there are early intervention services and um, and yeah, we don't want to, a child to wait. If we wait until that child is six and enters first grade to start providing speech and language intervention, he's already lost so much time. That was, um, was going to be my next question, uh, how important it is to have an early intervention and not just, well, he's, he's a little bit behind, but you know, we'll, we'll hold off and see on how it goes. Because sometimes even the primary cares might say that, like, well, he's a little bit behind, but let's just mm -hmm. keep at it and, and let's see if he catches up. I, I don't necessarily think that's going to happen unless you have an, an intervention. Is that correct? Yeah, there, certainly there are some kids who are just a little slow. You, you know, hear often, especially with boys of kids who don't start talking till they're three, and that does happen. And sometimes it's not a, a cause for concern and those kids catch up. But um, I think parents really have a gut feeling. You know, you know when there's something going on with your child. Uh, and uh, it's important to follow that and to, to take a look when you're feeling like your child isn't doing what his siblings did or what your other friends children are doing um, you know kids come to to first grade <clears throat> excuse me already knowing millions of words literally millions of words and so if we wait until they're six and they start school and we say wow this child just doesn't have the vocabulary isn't putting sentences together isn't communicating the way we would expect him to we've already lost so much time yeah, absolutely. Now, I got two questions based on what you just shared. One is we started seeing, um, especially in you know the the, the circles that have that have been at uh, a lot of the times in, in certain areas of a lot of tours. And I lived lived in Cancun for many years, so we saw a lot of families who lived half the year in the U.S., half the year in Mexico, uh, for instance, and. In those cases, it was actually quite common for children to delay speaking, but once they started speaking, they suddenly spoke English and Spanish, like interchangeably, like super yeah. fluently. Is this, is this something that would be expected and normal? Children who are bilingual um, do not have necessarily have any delay. Um, it's not too hard to learn two languages simultaneously that we have a proof of that in hundreds of thousands, if not millions of, of kids. And so 
Yeah, sometimes there's a little bit of a lag. There might be a little bit of a lag in one language over the other, um, but not necessarily, and it's not something to be concerned about. Um, and kids do grow up being bilingual and trilingual with yeah. no delay and no problem whatsoever. Yeah, for them, it's actually quite quite simple. I mean, our, our, yeah. our boy, we've always spoken to him. Like at home, we've always spoken to him in Spanish. But the funny thing is my wife's from Spain, so she has a Spanish accent. I'm from Mexico, so I have a Mexican <laughs> accent. And different and, Spanish. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, 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 then, and then we both, uh, then we, we lived in California until very recently. So outside, he was only speaking English. And, and it is so funny because he will understand pretty much either language. And certain things he'll communicate in English, certain things he'll communicate in Spanish. He's, he's not two yet, but, but it, is, it is really surprising how easily he goes from one. I have a young man with autism I've worked with for several years now. His uh, family is from Mexico. They live here in uh, Southern California. And he's been raised with both languages. He has autism. He's um, just entering his teen years, not quite there yet. And he uses augmentative communication. And he uses it in both language. Wow. Um, he can use an AA system in Spanish. He can use an AAC system in English. Um, he can type in either language. Um, and he speaks, speaks with AAC both languages fluently. I see. That's very interesting. Now, before we head, you know, get into that, which I do want to explore a lot, I'm very curious about it. There's another thing, and and. I don't know how common this is, but it certainly happened uh, when I was growing up. I, I'm the oldest of three boys. And I remember that my brother, the next one right after me, he delayed speaking. And when we, and this was early 80s, right? And when we went in there to talk to the pediatrician at the time, and my mom told him, uh, and not that I remember, I was three, but, but she would tell the story that, that he had no need to speak because he had an interpreter in that case uh -huh. myself who would always communicate his needs so he would just kind of like grumble or whatever and i would communicate his needs is this something that we that that you see kind of regularly with with absolutely siblings? um you see it a lot with the youngest in a family um who's got older siblings who do talk for him interpret for him doesn't need to communicate at some point though if there is nothing wrong quote unquote with him um, they begin to talk, yeah. you know, at some point they have to, and they've been taking in the language. They just haven't necessarily practiced a lot of it out loud, but, um, but we don't always see a delay with that. Once they catch up, they're on fire. Yeah. Cause they have we, no need, right? So yeah, we do see that tendency a lot in families of kids who have language disabilities, particularly those with complex communication needs or um, early difficulty with vocabulary and language acquisition, where the parent will interpret the needs. Oh, he doesn't need to learn to communicate. I know what he wants. Uh, I see. Um, and unfortunately, there are a whole host of problems with that. Um, and I, I regularly scare parents by saying, one day, you won't be there. And somebody won't know what he wants. Exactly. And that's the problem. Um, I've worked with uh, group homes uh, for many years and in a variety of residential settings. And yes, when we get a new resident who's 34 years old and has lived at home with his or her parents and uh, never really had to communicate other than some you know, vocalizations and a couple of gestures, and now they're in a setting where they're needing to be more independent, where people don't understand what those uh, nonverbal cues are. Um, and it's very, very difficult on everyone. that person involved, on, especially on everyone. Um, so that's sort of the biggest uh, thing I say to parents is stop communicating for him, stop anticipating his needs, um, let him tell you what he wants or needs or has to say. When communication becomes uh, more important for other functions beyond just requesting something, like saying, I want, um, then it, kids become more motivated to communicate more because it's not just a matter of I'm looking at that thing so you know that I want it. Um, but there's something I want to say that, that's not tangible, that's not right here. 
Yeah, of course. And I think it's it's very important that you bring it up with parents because at, at some point they won't be there and it doesn't necessarily have to be that dramatic. Something happens or, or they pass right. away. It can simply be like, you know, if, if he becomes a teenager or an adult and wants to go get something from a store or gets yeah. lost and needs to ask for directions or needs to ask for help, uh, then suddenly they, they, they have no ability to do it. And, and it sounds counterintuitive for you to be telling parents don't anticipate their needs or don't try to do that, right? <laughs> it does. So it is, it, I'm sure it's, it's a bit of a, of, of a stretch for many of them. It is. And it's, it's a lot harder um, for two groups of parents, I find. Those are very young children who hate to see their child upset and in distress. Um, and then older uh, parents of older children who have been doing this for many, many, many years. And it's, it's ingrained. It's what they do. It's how the environment works for them. Um, and I, don't, I tell parents not to cut them off cold turkey. Um, yeah. They're expecting you to know what they want. But let's work on introducing some, um, some requirement to be a little more specific or to communicate a little bit better for some of those times. Yeah, of course. We, you, I, I remember we had the, 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 the privilege of, of helping a family of a young man, man with autism, and he was 33, 34, some, somewhere around there. And both his parents were older, around 60, like late 60s. Yeah. And, and we had to have that conversation. We said, listen, it's, it's great, and I know that you both dedicate your life to him. But, but there will be a day where you won't be here, and he is, he's otherwise healthy. So he's still going to stick around for another 40, 50, 60 years. Um, and, and so far, you're the only two people in the world who can understand what he's saying. Exactly. <laughs> so we need yeah. to, to kind of like change that dynamic. And, and, and they, they, they understood, obviously. Uh, but it's hard because they had been doing that for 34 years. Exactly. Or 32 or however yeah. long. And, it, and it's hard to imagine um, the pain and the frustration that their child, who is now an adult, will feel when suddenly they're in an environment where people don't understand them and they can't get their point across. Exactly. And they don't see their parents. Yeah. Because their, <laughs> their parents become their world, uh, especially yes. not only because they are, but when they depend on them for, for every simple thing, not just feeding, but even communicating, and suddenly they're gone. It's, it's not only frustrating to not be able to communicate, and, but then you add the fact that you no longer have your parents. So it's, yeah. it's, it's really difficult. Now, let's, let's talk a little bit about augmentative communication. What, what is that? All right. So alternative and augmentative communication is any mode of communication that either adds to an individual's speech or uh, is a substitute for it. So uh, augmentative communication is not only for people who are completely nonverbal, uh, though that's the population that most people think about, um, but we're also looking at individuals who have something like cerebral palsy, and they have speech, but it's uh, difficult to understand them. Their intelligibility is reduced. And so, again, if they're in the community with people who are not that familiar with them, they have difficulty communicating because people don't understand them. Um, it can be used for people who have, again, some speech, but not enough language skills to be able to, uh, to say everything that they need to. People who need the visual cues of the symbols or the words to go, oh, that's the word that I'm looking for. I couldn't remember it. I wouldn't be able to pull it out of my head. But if I see it, I recognize it. And I know that that's what I want. Um, so that's the augmenting part, and then there's the alternative part where we have um, roughly 35% of individuals with autism who are nonverbal. And if you cannot um, produce language and communicate with others, the frustration level, the anxiety level is just tremendous. Um, and you know, a lot of us um, who are speech pathologists are fond of saying behavior is communication. If you improve the ability to communicate, a lot of that, if not all, of that behavior that um, you call inappropriate, maladaptive, whatever term we want to use for it, uh, dies down because that's born of the frustration and the anxiety. Of course, they're trying to communicate something. They're trying to let you and the people around you know them know that you know the problem is that they don't have 
the skill to actually exactly. communicate that. Is that correct? And it's not always, I want cookies or I want a drink. It's often things like, this is bothering me. Um, I want to do something different. Uh, leave me alone. All of those things that we don't get when we focus on, tell me what you want. Exactly. Because I think, and, and that's a very interesting point, because even, even I, as we started talking about this and I started picturing some of these different uh, needs to communicate, I start thinking about, well, when they need this, when they're hungry, when they're angry, when they're, you know, all, all these things. But, but what about when they just need to communicate something, when they just need to let you know that I enjoy this or I dislike this or I'm afraid? Yes, those commenting um uh, responses are huge and very important. One of the, the most important things um, you always want to have in an AAC system is something's wrong. Something's bothering me. Somebody hurt me. I don't feel good. I am upset. I need to walk away from this. Um, all of those comments, negative, positive, those are really, really important communication functions. And too often in uh, working with augmentative communication, we focus on just meeting the wants and the needs. Yeah. The basic, you want something to eat, you want something to drink, you want to go take a nap, um, and we don't get past that. And yet there are so many more things that, that these individuals have to say. Of course, especially when you start thinking about uh, the population that most likely will need these have special needs. So they're subject to bullying, they're subject to abuse, they're subject to so many other things. And, and, and then just thinking that they're not able to communicate that because they don't have the tools and the means to do it, um, it is, it's just adding more and more frustrations to them. It is. It's, um, it, it's, it's the reason why I do this and it's both sad and uh, wonderful at the same time. Um, because we know we can make a difference. Of course. And that's what I was going to say. I mean, I, I'm sure that in, in your years of experience, uh, the, 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 the feeling of, of fulfillment, of satisfaction, of seeing how you can empower a young person, because most of your patients are probably children or young teenagers. Yeah. And, and, and suddenly seeing them feel that, that empowerment, having their hands on these tools that yeah. they've never had. W what is that like? It's, it's amazing. It's wonderful. I have all sorts of stories of, um, of clients, kids who uh, didn't communicate or communicated through um, either aggressive behaviors or self-injurious behaviors. And, um, and we teach them to use a communication system and it opens up a whole world for them. Uh, one of my favorite stories is of a young man, 16 year old boy with autism, very self-injurious. Um, he had done, he's done permanent uh, neurological damage from biting his hand uh, so much. Um, I trained his uh, aide and his teacher to use a system that I made for him. Um, it was robust. It had a lot of vocabulary in it. Um, and they were a little overwhelmed at first, but you know, I walked them through it. We did the training and it did not take very long for this bright young man to, uh, to have a day where something went wrong. And uh, the APE teacher hadn't shown up, and this was a kid who needed to move. Um, he was big, and he was energetic, and he, it was a problem. And he started to bite his hand, the teacher told me, and then he stopped, and he looked at the communication system. And um, he navigated through that system to tell, me he was, to tell her that he was upset, that the APE teacher had not shown up, that he needed to go run around. And his aide took him out to the football field and he ran around. And that was just, those are the moments when you know that this is why you do what you do. Of course it um, is. And I want every parent to be able to have that feeling with their child. And, and that's exactly what I was going to say right now. How much, and, and I know because we've, we've had this, this experience, but those things seemingly small, how much of an impact do they have on that family's dynamics from that moment on? Exactly. Um, the, the knowledge that he doesn't have to hurt himself now when he's frustrated or upset, that he's got a way to tell what he wants and how he's feeling. And that was far more important to him than asking for a drink or a snack, which is all he had been able to do before that. He had a simple system with 
pictures of his, you know, top 10 reinforcers and he could ask for those, but that wasn't cutting it. Yeah, Not we, we see a lot him. of that in the community, the, right. the, the different picture boards and, and, and right. They, they do serve a very basic purpose, yes. but, but as human beings, we go beyond that basic yeah. need to exist and to survive. Communication has so many functions and we need to remember them when we're teaching these kids. Um, and that commenting uh, is one of the biggest ones. Exactly. And even before just being able to do that, I think that the fact that the parents now realize that he wasn't injuring himself because he wanted to or because there was something inherently wrong and, and, and it, so for self-harming, but it was the only way he could think of to communicate something, to, to release this tension, that, that this exactly. anxiety. So I think, I think those, are, those are two tremendously you know, powerful examples. We saw, we saw a lot of those. And, and one, of the, one of the examples that, that we got, and, and we dealt with stem cell treatments for, for, for children within the spectrum, right? And, and, and one of the most impactful things that I've remembered is this family. And they, they, they wrote back to us a couple of months later after the treatment. And they said, you know what? We had not been able to have a family dinner at a restaurant for 12 years until after the treatment. We were able to go to a restaurant. They're like, this, this, this was worth it because now we know what it is like to go to a restaurant as a family. Yeah. The little things that every other family does that families with a significantly disabled child don't get to experience. And not just the family doesn't get to experience, but the child doesn't get to experience. And the lack of these background experiences in their lives is part of what leads kids to have difficulty in school um, because they don't understand the contexts for the stories they're being read or uh, the message that they have to learn in, in a class. They don't have the background with those experiences to understand any of this. Yeah, they, um, they live in a different world because yeah. they experience the world differently. So for exactly. them, that experience of life, and, and you're absolutely right, I hadn't thought about it, but they, they, they see a textbook where the family is going out to a restaurant and they have no idea what a restaurant yeah, is. Exactly. Thinking, why would it be two or three tables in the dining room? <laughs> well, yeah. People? One of the tests uh, that we use standardized as for uh, narrative language development, one of the, the fir very first task, and it has to do with listening to a story about a family that goes to McDonald's. And uh, if you've never been able to take the child to McDonald's, they have no way of understanding and responding to that task. Well, let's hope they update that and change McDonald's. <laughs> We're working on it. <laughs> Something less harmful, but... <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that if somebody who works like high up at McDonald's listen to this show, they're going to write back to me and say like, what's your problem with us? Because I always, I always use them as an example. Maybe we can go to the salad bar. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but they're not the only ones uh, no. to say that, that not in, in the good books. Now, so far we've been talking about very obvious examples um, of, of, of children and people in, in, in general who can benefit from, from these different um, modalities that, that you guys utilize. But, what are some more, and I don't want to say common, but what are some more realistic cases or scenarios where, and even realistic is not the right word, but something that the average person who doesn't have like a diet, whose children don't have like a diagnosed condition, uh, they could benefit from some of these uh, different uh, modalities. Is there any? Um. <sighs> Cognitive communication is, is seeing wider and wider applications um, these days. And while we certainly still focus on the individuals who are, uh, have a language disability, who have uh, complex communication needs, and yes, we, we do still focus on, as I said, those individuals who have some speech but uh, difficulties with intelligibility, we also see... Um, other applications for individuals um, sometimes who have a temporary problem. For example, if uh, you're in the hospital and you've had some sort of accident and you may have a breathing tube in and you can't, uh, you can't talk. And so we would use um, augmentative communication for you to be able to communicate with us while you're recuperating, while that's a problem. Um, 
off the top of my head, I can't think of a lot of applications for your average person. Um, but, uh, but again, even um, well-educated uh, professional individuals can have word retrieval problems um, and rely on a visual cue to help them find what they're looking for. Um, that's probably the most common way that, um, that individuals without a uh, more mm, specific uh, language diagnosis would... Or a stroke or something along those lines. And yeah. I didn't, I, I, I didn't mean to put you on the stop no. on the spot. Uh, it's funny. just that I was just thinking about, because I, w I was reading the other day about this new device that, that they're working on uh, in order to grab the input from the visual field and translate it into different stimuli throughout the body. So it's a yeah. vibrational uh, vest. And, and, and the, 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 the case is that you start using it while you're still seeing. So you start recognizing some of these different vibrational inputs in your body. And, and it gets to the point where your brain starts interpreting those and, and putting the two together. So now you can actually see with your eyes closed. And, and while this, these devices were thought of for people who were losing their sight, now they're being used for people to augment their senses. So, yeah. so basically becoming bionic uh, because they can, they can see greater, greater, um, greater spectrums of light. They can start seeing infrared and other things that we normally can't see. So I was thinking maybe there is something, some, some other uh, cool application along those lines coming down. There probably is. It's, it's just incredible. It's mind boggling to me. When I started in this field, we taught kids with autism some signs. That was, was brand new when I was starting. And technology was nowhere. There was no technology. Uh, the first communication devices, you had to program each word in phonetically, uh, which took hours and hours yeah. and a lot of time breaking down words to go, wait a minute, that sound, that phoneme doesn't work there. Um, and well, some people would argue that when you started your, your career, autism didn't exist. Right oh, it there. did. <laughs> I know it did. did. It just wasn't as common. Um, I, was, I was 10 years old when that documentary came on TV that I, that I first saw. Um, and nobody knew what autism was. It was still called childhood schizophrenia. Um, and, um, and the documentary was about uh, Bruno Bettelheim School in Chicago. And, of course, um, he has since become uh, vilified. Uh, for the way that he vilified uh, mothers um, yeah. in the theory of refrigerator, yeah, the refrigerator moms, moms. Who made kids um, have autism. So we have come a long way in the field of autism as well as um, augmentative communication, which is still a relatively baby field. Um, but the research is starting to pile up and uh, people are becoming more aware. Um, October is uh, augmentative communication awareness month. And um, so a lot of us are gearing up to, again, try and make individuals, uh, your average citizen, aware, um, just like the autism community has uh, made autism awareness uh, much more of a visible effort. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think it is necessary uh, that, that we recognize that there's other people with different capabilities that we have than, than the average person who are sharing this world with us. And we need to make it accessible to them so that they can exactly. have that exact same experience. And it's right. not about having special considerations. It's just about saying, you know what, if I was not able to do these things, I would, I would want somebody to help me experience them. If you can't walk, you use a cane or a wheelchair. If you can't talk, this is the tool that you use. Exactly. Um, it's not a luxury. It's not an option. Communication is a right. Um, and every child um, has the right to have his own voice in one way or another. Absolutely. And it is so important for, for, for so many things in terms of development. Now, before we wrap this episode up, I, I always like to ask our guests, um, what are your top two or three actionable pieces of advice that you would recommend somebody who's listened to this episode and maybe they have identified some, and, and I'm just going to say minor delay in, in, in their children, because I'm assuming that if it was not minor, if it was major, they had already seeked out help. But for, for those parents who have just identified and, and maybe have that gut feeling that you mentioned at first that, you know what, he might be a little bit behind what would be your top two or three recommendations that they should start looking into? Okay, so not a population that I tend to work with. Um, 
uh, those, those kids with mild delays see all sorts of other speech pathologists and professionals. Um, but, uh, but yeah, um, having, again, use those routines. Um, and this is the advice I give for parents working with augmentative communication too. Uh, kids with severe disabilities, no matter where your child is um, on that spectrum of language uh, difficulty. Use those routines. Those are really, really important for building language. Um, when you're teaching your child um, how to brush his teeth or wash his hands or get dressed, you are saying the same words repeatedly. You are saying them in the same sequence. The child learns to anticipate what you're going to say and learns what those words mean and what the sequence of actions is supposed to be for that task. Um, that's one of the best ways to build language um, in your child, no matter how severe or not severe the delay is. Um, make sure that your child has access to a robust vocabulary. So whether you have a child with, again, minor uh, language delays, that you're just maybe thinking there might be something there, uh, take a look at the vocabulary. Give him or her um, models and examples of using a wider variety of vocabulary um, in various contexts. And um, again, that vocabulary might change if you've got somebody with a more severe disability. You might be focusing more on those very basic beginning core high frequency words that they can use one word at a time. But no matter how you do it um, or where on that continuum your child is, you want to make sure they have access to the vocabulary that they need. And, um, and you want to make sure, again, for either group, anywhere on that continuum, that, um, that just lost my train of thought. What was that? <laughs> Don't get old. Uh, <laughs> um, let's see. That, um, that you're, you're giving them uh, lots of reasons to communicate, that it's genuine communication. Uh, we tend, when we think there's a problem or we know there's a problem with our child, to test them. What's that? What does this mean? Tell me what that is. Um, and that's, that's not genuine communication. And for any child, that's stressful. Whether you've got a child with a, a minor delay or, um, or one who can't uh, marshal language at all, that's, um, that's anxiety producing. And what we want is to reduce the anxiety. We want communication to be for real purposes. Um, so make it motivating, uh, make it genuine, and don't test. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about one that will be in your area of expertise. For, for those parents who are listening to us who have a, ch a child in the spectrum or who know somebody who has a child in the spectrum, is your recommendation for every child in the spectrum to actually look into these different communication uh, skills and devices? Because sometimes what we've seen is that sometimes children might be verbal, but, but they're still behind in terms of how well they communicate. So would something like this be useful and valuable? It's really, um, again, you know, it is a spectrum and, um, and not every child with autism uh, will need augmentative communication. We know that autism um, is a dis disability or disorder of language in a big way. Um, communication is always impacted, and yet there are many people with autism who, um, who have terrific language skills, who are able to speak to others, who can meet their communication needs. You know, we just have to look at and, and listen to Temple Grandin. Um, and so not everybody needs augmentative communication. We do have lots of kids who are not totally nonverbal, but who do have some speech, but it's not enough to meet their needs, or it's not enough uh, to, to say that they're living up to their potential in terms of language development skills. And then we want to take a look at that. And so um, you might have a child um, who is somewhere in the middle there, and people will say, well, he's verbal, he doesn't need AAC. Um, and that's not necessarily true. So again, as a parent, you have the feeling, um, you know your child, um, you know when he or she is struggling or if there's a problem. And so don't be intimidated by people who say, nope, he talks, he doesn't need it because he might. Um, but don't think that just because you have a child on the spectrum that he'll need um, an augmentative communication system. 
Um, so go for an assessment. Um, find yourself a speech pathologist who knows AAC. Um, that can be difficult. We are getting more and more people into telepractice uh, now for AAC <coughs> to reach those areas where uh, there isn't somebody. But that's the best way to assess whether your child actually does need AAC. I see. That's, that's, that's good to know. Um, perfect. Perfect. So before we wrap this episode up, I do want to take a moment and acknowledge you for not only for your generosity of spending this hour here with us and, and sharing your knowledge okay. and, uh, and, and your expertise, but for the work that you're doing. I, I personally know how, how stressful and ungrateful it can sometimes be to work with, with different special needs uh, communities, but also know the other side of the coin, which is, which is incredibly gratifying when you, you see that you can empower someone and you can really see that you're making an impact in their life. However, I also know how, how, how tiring and difficult it can be. So I definitely do want to acknowledge you and, and, and recognize you and thank you for the work that you do with this. Well, thank you. And before we say goodbye, when can people go and, and learn more about you? Um, I have a website, which is susanberkowitz.net, so easy to remember. Um, the book has its own website, which is maketheconnectionbook.com. Um, I uh, have this a blog. a book for parents, right? Before a book for parents. Um, it's make, called Make the Connection. A so it's not a technical <laughs> textbook or anything like that. No, it okay, is, is written for parents in easy-to-follow language, actionable tips, step-by-step step from the beginning through um, phrases and sentences, what to do, how to do it. From Make the Connection, a practical guide to parents and practitioners for teaching the nonverbal child to communicate available on Amazon in Kindle and paperback. Uh, if you have Kindle Unlimited, it is free to read. <laughs> oh, wow. There you um, go. And yeah, so I, I want to get it into the hands of as many parents as possible. Perfect. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, one very final question. Did you have a good time now here on the Highwood Health Show? Absolutely. It was lovely talking to you. Awesome. It's been a pleasure having you. For everyone listening to us, remember that if you're listening to this on a podcast app, all you need to do to see all the links that Susan just shared with us, including a link to get a, a Kindle Unlimited subscription to buy her book and to do all those sorts of cool things, uh, you just need to scroll to the episode's description and find all the information there. Same thing if you're watching on YouTube, you know how that works. Just scroll below. You'll see everything down there in this, in this episode's description. Thank you once again for tuning in. You've been listening to Dr. E and Susan Berkowitz talk about augmentative communication. I will see you here next week. Thank you for listening to Dr. E's Highway to Health show, helping you learn the science of living ageless. Did you enjoy the show? Please like, share, and subscribe where you listen to podcasts. Dr. E wants to hear from you. Go to dre.show. Again, that's dre.show. Until next time, this is Dr. E's Highway to Health, helping you live ageless. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. I certainly did. For someone who knows how necessary these communication skills can be for families of children with autism, I really appreciate how important Susan's work is. Remember that there's links to everything we spoke about in this episode's description, as well as in our complete show notes. If you would like to read Susan's book for free, though, head on over to dre.show forward slash Kindle to get a free trial of Kindle Unlimited. And if you prefer physical books, as I said before, you can find the links to her book, to the complete show notes, and everything else we discussed about in this episode description, either scrolling in your podcast app or down below if you're watching on YouTube. Before we go, remember to please take a moment and leave us a rating and a review. It, it helps us not only get noticed by other people, but also as feedback for what you would like to listen to, what you think of our episodes, what we can do to improve, and pretty much anything else you'd like to say about our show. The easiest way to rate us is by going over to dre.show forward slash rate. Once again, I hope you enjoyed this episode. You have been listening to Susan Berkowitz and Dr. E talk about augmentative communication. Thank you for tuning in. I'll see you here next week. And remember, you're in the highway to health and I'm your guide to get you there.